Terry has retired now from Lockheed Martin. She was an engineer, test, test, test engineer. engineer. I said test engineer. But she got into genealogy a few years back and discovered, yay and nay, that she didn't really have a lot of American genealogy. Most of her genealogy is an immigrant through Canada, France. She has very interesting genealogy, which worked out perfectly since she speaks fluent French. And she volunteers at one of the um, LDS Family History Centers on Alta Mesa in the Wedgwood part of town. And she does some transcribing of French records for genealogy groups. So without any further ado, we are looking forward to these skeletons in the closet. Did you see my George Bernard Shaw yes. quote up there? Are you yeah. gonna, I didn't know if I stole your <laughs> Welcome, Terry. Come on down. She's our... And teaches our beginner's classes. Don't forget that. Probably going to have to adjust my sound down a little bit. Maybe. A little overwhelming. Thank you, Suzanne. Good evening, and thank you for inviting me to speak again this evening. Um, how many of you have discovered some perhaps ne'er do well people in your background? Okay, we're seeing uh, several hands. If you haven't discovered them, perhaps they are lurking in the background. And we're going to talk about some of the ways that you might be able to find them and to determine what their true story um, is and perhaps how to share that with others in the family. So, um, first of all, every family does have some. Um, and when we discover these things and do some research in them, sometimes it helps us to understand better about the circumstances that the family fell into, um, what forced them to move to other areas, um, etc. And it gives us a, that better opportunity to possibly end destructive cycles, um, come to terms with the truth. So, Starting with family lore, how many of you found out about these um, skeletons by a story coming down? You know, uncle so-and-so was a horse thief, grandpa so-and-so um, had to move west because he killed somebody back in Alabama. Um, many families have these stories that have passed down um, as family lore and you need to investigate them. Um, are they 100% true? Is there another side to the story, perhaps? So we want to look to see whether your ancestor might have been the perpetrator or was he or she the victim in a set of circumstances. The biggest thing in terms of methodology is you want to get the proof. Do you want to confirm the story or do you want to refute the story? And we're going to look at some uh, case studies tonight where there are some iffy circumstances um, and not necessarily some definitive pointers that say, bad guy. So, and as we do with all of our genealogy research, we want to do it systematically. Start with what you know and then do the research and flesh out the opportunities to further look at things. One of the uh, tools that I use a lot of is timelines. Construct a timeline. If this um, skeleton or this person that you are investigating, if you know when they were born, when they married, um, but there are vast gaps in that timeline, draw it out. See what you can come up with to see how you can fill in those intervening years to see where they might have been and what they were doing at that time. And some of the uh, uh, research tools that are available are our census data, newspaper articles. If you truly have a villain in your family, there's going to be a write-up in the newspaper. Um, courthouse research, were they brought to trial? Were they um, condemned to the insane asylum? Um, there are many things that are in the courthouse. 
And in one case, we'll talk a little bit about land records and how they may shade uh, your decisions. Death certificates and, of course, coroner's reports also will help you um, if your person might have been the victim of a crime. What is the misdeed that was done in your family? Um, over the last couple of centuries, um, especially in the 20th and 21st century, mores and social acceptability um, has changed a lot. Where an illegitimate child was perhaps never spoken of, nowadays um, we see children being born out of wedlock on a pretty regular basis. It does not have the same onus on it that it one time did. So we want to evaluate the life and social times um, of our ancestors to see um, how that sin fits in. Um, and if you're planning on sharing the information, you need to be sensitive. Um, is this someone that is potentially still alive? Is this someone that um, will um, affect the cohesion of the family? Will it, is it something that might be very, very destructive as far as family relationships are concerned? So you need to be sensitive about sharing it. So Debbie stole some of my thunder <laughs> with her poster. So let's look at a couple, one of our skeletons. Um, we talked about the societal issues. Um, here is a list of several of them uh, that might come up, that you might uh, discover in your family history. Then there are also those criminal activities. And then we just have the small rogues and scoundrels, those people that were always labeled black sheep in the family. They may not have committed a really serious crime, but they were always on the edge of something exciting. So. We're going to look at um, some case studies. And the first case study that I have is Agnes Loftus. Family lore said that Agnes abandoned her husband and children to pursue a career on Broadway. So that was the story that came down through the family. And when looking at the 1940 census, number one, we find her in New York State. And she's Agnes Norman. Number one, her name has changed. She's gone from um, Agnes Igis to Agnes Norman. Now, you probably couldn't get too many roles on Broadway with a name like Agnes Igis. <laughs> so we, we see where she um, changed her name. She's only listed as a lodger. She's not listed as an actress or a production assistant or a makeup artist or anything like that. But she is in New York. So there's a little bit of credence when looking into it. So we go back and we look in 1930. Here again, she's in New York. We're also looking at her advanced age. In 1940, she was 67. So probably um, at the time, in 1940, a 67-year-old actress isn't going to be um, finding too many roles. In 1930, she's 57 years old. She's still a lodger. But in 1920, she's in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. She's a rumor, and she was listed as an actress. Credence to that family rumor. She left the family. We cannot find her or her husband in the 1910 census. But we do find her daughter living with her maternal aunt in Salt Lake City. We find her son living in Nebraska with his maternal grandparents. So she abandoned the family, but the children have gone to live with her side of the family. So what did happen and where are we going to look? In the 1900 census, the family is intact. Her husband is Horace Iggis, 
And in, as, in 1909, he claims that's when she deserted him. And this is then is in the census, just the children. So I told you about making a timeline. Let look at, let's look at the husband, Horace's timeline. He was born in Bedford County, Pennsylvania. Um, and when he was 16 years old, the family moved from Bedford County, which is a um, Amish. It's a very high, um, high concentration of Amish in that county, although this family was not Amish. Um, but we see church-going conservative people, and they moved to Sydney, Nebraska. And it's really, Google Sydney, Nebraska, and you will find that it was just a, rail, a railroad terminus and a cattle town. There were 27 saloons. I found one article that said that there were 80 saloons. <laughs> There wasn't a single church in the town. This 16-year-old boy is moving from Pennsylvania to a town with 27 to 80 saloons, brothels, gaming houses, etc. And there's a whole list of names for this town. You know, the Wicked Burg, Sinful Sydney, and there was a whole list of them. And we've got one 16-year-old boy moving in. He met, Horace married Agnes in Sydney in 1890, and their daughter was born uh, the year later. And when the railroad uh, veered and went up to the Black Hills because there was Black Hills gold, the town was bypassed. So the family was in the grocery business, but they were forced to move as the decline of the town occurred. Horace moved to Laramie, Wyoming, where he drilled wells. Then he moved to Sterling, Colorado, where his son was born. Then he eventually moved to Salt Lake City, where he worked for the Union Pacific Railroad. When the Spanish-American War broke out, he served in the Philippines for that short period of time, comes back to um, Salt Lake City after the war. And here we see in 1908 that his son William steals and drinks whiskey. It was in the newspaper. So, six days later, Horace files for bankruptcy. So, was there family stress going on six days prior? That's why he went out and got the, stole the whiskey. So what is going on in the family household? Horace declares bankruptcy in the beginning of 1909. Agnes deserts him 10 months later. Horace files for divorce. The divorce is finalized. And Horace remains in Salt Lake City until his death. So that's his timeline. Let's look at Agnes's timeline. She was born in Pennsylvania and her family moved to North Platte, Nebraska. Um, so not that far from Sydney, but at least a more stable community. She married at 17 years of age. And then we find in some of the records, uh, newspaper articles, she's only 17 years of age, but in 1905, you know, that's 15 years later, she's performing in a school play. So she is 32 years old, and she's in school. In 1907, she's 34 years old, and she graduates from eighth grade. Times were different. In 1910, she's working on a high school committee. So this is a 30, almost 40-year-old woman, and she's attending high school. She's listed in the city directories as a student in 1911 and 1912. And as we saw in the census, by 1920, she's in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and listed as an actress. 
the 1940 census also tells us that she did actually complete four years of high school. But she was probably a 30 to 40 year old woman when she did. So we've got the two timelines of what's going on here. So let's think about it. Hans's life is pretty much on the decline. He loses his business. By 1910, he loses his family. And with that whiskey and default um, bankruptcy, was he drinking? Did he start abusing his family as a reaction to his negative circumstances? Agnes, on the other hand, is on the rise. She completes her education, and it could not have been easy for her. She had two children to raise, um, and she was a 30-year-old woman, but she did it. She ensured that her children were sent to stable homes, and they were sent to stable homes on her side of the family. So did she leave to escape an abusive relationship? and in order to protect her children. As it turns out, while Horace's um, death certificate does not list um, alcoholism as his cause of death, both Horace and his son William were alcoholics. Um, and there were many newspaper articles that did point to that. So we're kind of leaning more towards the story where Agnes may not have deserted her family, but sought a way to protect her family. So that's why I say, investigate the case to see, are they the victim, are they per the perpetrator, or the victim? So, let's look at some other possible um, cases for um, what kinds of uh, ne'er-do-wells we can find. Um, here's an 1840 Kentucky census, and we have William Adams. And because I can't, I can't read, I think he was a trainman. I think he's an engineer. But if you'll notice, it's the census taker crossed it out, and he's in jail. So, you know, looking at the census, you may find some surprising details that you didn't know about. So, on that particular day in 1880, Mr. Adams was in jail. Um, we do find illegitimate births recorded in, uh, this happens to be a church uh, baptism record, but we notice that this child's name is the same as her mother's name. They are not married. Newspaper articles are going to point to suicides, um, other negative things. Here's a marriage license, um, and I thought this was really interesting. Um, Charles Helzer is a resident of the state prison of Southern Michigan upon his marriage. So what's he in for? You need to do the research and find out. So you may discover some of these things in other records. Uh, this is a case of larceny. Uh, I love the name. James uh, signed an appearance bond for the same reason. He cited his religious scruples. Um, and that's why he objected. And the constable released him. So a little vignette not necessarily a scoundrel. So let's look at another um, case history, um, seeing some of the varied uh, places where you can find um, things. This one happens to